It's podcast day. It's podcast day. Welcome in, friends. Hello, friends. <laughs> I am fine with recording uh, some of the realities of how I start this podcast recording process at times. I look into the camera and notice that um, some of my hair wants to do its own thing, and so I have to tame it a little bit. Welcome. Welcome in to the Hey Brownberry podcast. I welcome you back here. I welcome myself back to this recording and sharing process. And if it's your first time visiting with me, I'm really glad that you clicked on the thumbnail that brought you here. I have been making quite a bit for the last few weeks, but primarily that making has been focused on a single project, which I'll talk to you about. And just in the last couple of days, I picked back up something that I was talking about in my last episode, which was some sewing. And I'll share that with you as well. And uh, I came back to this space because I reminded myself that part of the goal of my podcast is to chronicle my own making journey and that the reality of my current making journey is that it is living amongst other prominent things in my life, like work. (laughs) I'm guessing that some number of you out there also work full-time, part-time, work in your own home. Um, Maybe you do uh, care for family members or children. You know, very likely there is another thing that you spend your time doing when you're not knitting or crocheting or sewing and so on. Me too, friends. Me too. (laughs) Where to begin? Um, I'm recording this right at the very beginning of April. And I have noticed this year that the spring season has been cooler and more enjoyable than I remember. But I have to caveat that by saying, for many years I've lived in Florida and almost given up on the thought of an actual spring season. And when I say actual spring season, I mean cooler, breezy weather that's a bit more mild. I'm accustomed to thinking of the weather here as skipping spring and going straight into summer with high temperatures. But this year, I've really noticed the evenings that still stay a bit cool and the mornings that still have a bit of uh, chill in the air. And of course, all of these things I'm saying are relative to our normal temperatures. Um, So a cool morning might be low 70 degrees and a breezy evening might get us maybe down into the 60s Fahrenheit. And I'm clinging to those days knowing that the days where the weather is so hot I will be less inclined to be outside. Those days are coming. I have to be grateful to my garden because I think that's another reason I've really noticed temperature and um rainfall and breeze and and anything having to do with those outside elements is much more noticeable to me now. I'm watching little plants that I put into the ground to see how they're responding to the higher midday temperatures. And I've also found the garden to be quite an escape for me this year. It started last year with a few plants that I had in the ground that I really wanted to tend to. And this year, I put even more seeds in the ground and I'm realizing that being out in the garden and doing what I call my circuit, where I go out through the back patio door and walk around the house to the different areas where I've planted things, that circuit has really been a very nice, soothing escape. Um, The job that I do is pretty intense. I work in a technology company 
and I manage a relationship for our company that is high pressure and almost constant chaos at this point because A, I'm new in the role and two, (laughs) it just has those elements built into it. And so many of my days require an intentional break if I want to to be able to sustain the energy and the focus that I need for the job. So my circuit around the garden has been that, and I'm so grateful for that. Do you have something like that, a thing that you do in your day that kind of breaks up the other things that you have to do? If you do, I'd love to hear about it. For some people, it might just be sitting down for a cup of tea. It might be going onto Instagram and checking in um, on your friends. And I know that for me, the feel of sun on my skin reminds me that there's something outside of that computer screen that's beneficial and beautiful. So I'm grateful to the garden for that. Not all of my plants are doing great. I tried some vegetables this year for the first time in several years, and I put them in my Hugelkulter garden, which I've talked about in a previous episode, which is um, kind of a garden mound that's built on top of logs and yard debris. And some of them, like my radishes, are doing pretty well based on the foliage that I can see, and some of them really didn't take off at all, like the beets. I suspect that I just didn't have the dirt deep enough for them to really take hold. That's my current suspicion. Um, I had some lettuce in there as well, and they just, they're not, they just don't look like they're thriving. (laughs) And I know this is the way of things. It's all an experiment, really. Um, And it's okay. I think I've come to a very settled attitude about it. I'm I'm fortunate that I have many sources from which to get my produce. (laughs) And um, the planting of these seeds has more to do with me wanting more greenery in my life, more reason to be outside, wanting a greater focus on where my food comes from, that kind of thing. But I'm starting very small, and I know that that means I won't succeed right away at all of it. So it's all good. I think if you're in the Northern Hemisphere you uh, and you are into gardening or, or wanting to try that, you're probably coming right into the season of planting, right? I would say our season maybe starts a little earlier because we don't have kind of a frost date. We do have low temperatures in January and February, but for the most part, it's not the kind of temperatures that make or break a planting season. So I was able to get my seeds into the ground pretty early. I'm hoping the rains will now come with regularity to help some of those things along. My dye plants, my uh, marigolds, are doing very well. I was quite successful growing marigolds last year, and uh, I say that like I had something to do with it. The marigolds really seem to like my yard, and so I put more of them in the ground, (laughs) and I'm happy about that. I mean, I... I have no shortage of dye materials in my pantry, but I just like having them. I like having them available in a quantity that means when I get back into yarn dyeing and fabric dyeing, I have lots of plant materials to choose from. With marigolds, I get beautiful yellows, shades of orange. Um, With a modifier like iron, I can get green and Thinking about natural dyeing as a play uh, or a practice, I'm fine with having a limited color palette because a lot of the joy comes from the fact that these colors are from plants from my yard. So I think of that as all a part of the process, growing the plants, dyeing the material, and then using the material. I do think about expanding the dye garden to add other things, but yeah, I'm taking that slowly. On the subject of slowly, 
I have embraced slower making for the last several months. I really have. I'm a person that can form uh, new interests like that. And so when I notice that I'm sticking with something, it really stands out to me. I took on a sweater project a few months ago um, in Malia. It's an Amalia uh, pullover pattern by Emily Green. And I've shown it here many times. And in fact, showing it here many times is a new practice for me. There was a time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share it with you here momentarily. There was a time when I would totally fall into this habit of wanting to only share on Instagram and here on YouTube when I had things that were finished or almost finished or things that were new. So to me, that was a measure of what's interesting. It's interesting when you pick up a new hobby or um, when you found a new book. Um, it's interesting when you finish something that you've been working on. And several months ago, it was like, I had this realization that to continue perpetuating an idea that making is a very quick process, at least this kind of hand making is a quick process, is not really honest for me. It's not authentic to the experience. I work full time. I have several interests. <laughs> And just those two things to alone together mean that my projects take me quite a while to finish. I also moved recently away from working on a lot of different knitting projects at a time as a way to focus on that slow, intentional making. And I shared all of the works in progress that I have. A few of them are garments and garments take me a while to complete, whether it's knitting or crochet. And by turning my attention to one of them, it sped up the process in that I saw a lot more progress on this project as I was going along. But knitting a garment for my body size on a size US 3 needle, a 3.25 millimeter needle, takes time. <laughs> and I'm embracing that. So I've turned away from this idea that you're coming here just to see what I've finished or to see what's new. Uh, and you can tell me in the comments how you feel about your own making process and if that's shifted for you in the last couple of years. We all have this global crossroads point that we can relate to now with the pandemic. And I just think whether it was that specific catalyst or just my time in life, I just think that there has been a shift for me in several things, and this is one of those things in my making. So I'm very happy to report that my Amalia pullover is going well. I have made a lot of progress recently on the sleeves. I finished the body, the front and back of the body are done. And I'm working the sleeves the same way that I worked the body pieces. I'm working them concurrently. I have both uh, sleeves on circular needles. One just happens to be a bit longer cable than the other. That's the only difference. But um, so let me pause there for a second. I say that's the only difference. I did some measuring on these the other day. So what I do is I work a few inches on one. I put that one down. I work a few inches on the other. And I did some measuring the other day. And with this pattern, it's easy to count things like the number of cable repeats I've finished. Um, and then I measure with my ruler from the cast on edge to see how far I've reached in the intended measurement. And even though I completed the same number of repeats and finished the increasing that was required, the sleeves were different lengths. And that was curious, that shouldn't be, right? Same needle size, I double checked. Um, same number of completed repeats, which should mean that they should measure the same length, but they didn't, one was longer than the other. So I just kind of put the two pieces in front of me and really look closely at them. And to your eye or to the camera's eye, there isn't much difference when looking at them. But the ruler doesn't lie, and I decided to take a really close look at the gauge. Well, it turns out that all not all size three needles are created the same. 
I measured the needle tips in my needle gauge and they're size three, but it seems that one is ever so slightly thicker than the other. I could tell that when I was pushing it through the needle gauge, I could tell that, but it really is obvious in the measurement of the two sleeves. Now it's not, it's not a difference that's gonna derail the project. That's what I'll say. In fact, what I decided to do is I switched the needle tips on the sleeves. So the ones that were slightly smaller, I moved to the sleeve that had a slightly bigger gauge. Thinking that at this point, I just need to kind of balance out the overall gauge. I, I don't even know if that's logical thinking, but it's what I decided to do. And in fact, I'm knitting to a measurement. So what really matters is that I reach the length that is needed before I start the armhole shaping. And I know I can do that just using my ruler to measure. And if it turns out that there's one more cable cross, if it turns out I have one more cable cross on one sleeve than the other, no one is going to notice that or know about it, except you all. It'll be our secret. Mm. Shout out to my friend. Shout out to my friend Natalie the Potter, who makes gorgeous ceramic mugs for yarny folk. So I'm okay with where I am in this project. I feel that it is, um, it's still very much on track. And when I say on track, I should address that as well. At this point, the project has somewhat of a deadline. I didn't previously have a deadline for it, except that, you know, I would love to wear it in a time where the temperature cooperates. That won't really be the case here in Florida when I finish this. Uh, later this month is my plan. But I am headed to Wonderwool, Wales in the UK. And I'm very excited about that for all the reasons you can imagine. I am taking a trip with some friends to take part in the festival and to do a little bit of visiting in London. All of the good, excited feelings about that and all of the terrified, nervous feelings about that. I have traveled since the pandemic began and have had varying levels of anxiety around it and have had various experiences with travel, mostly good, very good. I have not contracted COVID or um, had issues with folks close to me or part of that travel contracting COVID, but that doesn't take away the nervousness around, around it. So um, I'll be taking all of my precautions, but I'm just openly acknowledging that nowadays travel even with friends for a great woolly reason it has its levels of it brings its levels of uh, anxiety so I think good thoughts <laughs> but it means that in April I will very likely be able to wear my sweater it's always cold on an airplane so that's one opportunity I'm going to a place that has lower temperatures than the place where I live so definitely I will have this sweater with me uh, with the intent to enjoy wearing it over there. Yeah, I'm excited about the connections within these pieces that will go right along with that trip. So now it has a deadline of about a few weeks from now, and I'm feeling good about where I am. I think the armhole shaping won't take me very long on these sleeves. Uh, the seaming up will probably be the next longest session. So all of the pieces need to be seamed together and you know, it's, it's a significant amount of work to do that in a way that's tidy, but that's okay. I'm normalizing slow making. My other recent interest obsession is hand sewing. <laughs> in fact, earlier this week, I completed a class on whole cloth quilting. Whole cloth quilting, if you haven't really heard about that before, is this concept of sewing large stitches on um, larger pieces of cloth. So it's in contrast to um, patchwork quilting techniques where you seam together pieces of cloth and then make a larger fabric out of that, um, or modern quilting, which has very precise geometric piecing. 
a whole cloth actually is about the stitching and the design of the stitching on a larger piece of fabric. So I took a class with Tatter Blue Library, uh, a remote class online, and this is my practice piece. I'll insert some video so you can see that a little more closely. Um, it's just two pieces of cloth, a 12 by 12 inch piece with some batting in between and a 14 by 14 inch piece on the back, which I will also use to border this practice piece. Um, the reason that you do that is it's just easier on your shoulder. You don't have to extend so much to, to pull the thread through each time. I enjoyed the class. I've taken a few classes now and attended a couple of lectures with Tatter Blue Library. I have to give them a shout out. I particularly like the aesthetic um, that, that Tatter has. And I also notice that the teachers that they choose, uh, it's a very diverse group of teachers, um, ethnically, culturally, creatively diverse, and that their teachers often espouse this love of the way things were and this love of traditional making, at least for the classes that have caught my interest. And yeah, I applaud them for that. I think there is something to be said for the instructors that you choose and the way in which they represent your organization's um, aesthetic and mindset and view of the world. And so I just have to commend them for that. I will link to Tatter in the description box below. And this whole cloth quilting class was a two hour online class. Uh, you get the materials list or you can order the materials as a kind of a kit to go along with the class. I have been interested in this method of quilting in particular because I took another class on hand sewing that really lit a fire in me for this particular method of slow making. Stitching is something I once told myself I would not be good at because it felt to me like another one of those things that would really show your mistakes in a very glaring way. And I shy away from things that I'm not good at immediately. It's, it's part of, it's just part of how I am. And it's a thing that I'm working on because I would like to be someone who takes on more new things by acknowledging that that's how I am, but not letting that stop me from taking on new things. And with stitches, you know, you can tell when you're making a line of stitches and that line is not straight. <laughs> you can tell probably a beginner piece from uh, a piece that was done by someone who has stitched for a long time quite easily. You know, the difference is glaring. But what I'm learning is that only matters as far as I allow it to matter. And whole cloth quilting being about the stitching can be daunting if I let it, or it can be freeing. So the piece that I've worked on has um, a motif on it that I actually created with a small serrated rolling edge. So I basically, I don't draw the lines on with a pencil. Um, I use a small sewing tool to make almost like a, a nearly perforated line. And so when I put those lines on, I can follow them with my stitches, you know, then I don't have anything like chalk or a pen to rub out afterward. I embrace this idea of making a picture with the stitch. And that picture can be very simple. It can just be parallel lines or lines that cross, or it can be more complex. It can be lines that imitate a specific image like feathers or shell shapes um, or something in between like curved lines and circles and arches. I love the freedom of that. And as I said in another episode talking about hand sewing, I just love the squish that comes from stitching multiple pieces of fabric together. There's something about the way that simple step adds texture that I'm crazy about. 
any quilters out there, hand quilters, have you tried whole cloth quilting? You know, in, the, in concept, this is a small practice piece, right? So this is just a square. Maybe this square would be part of, it would be a block in another larger quilt. But in concept, you could take a very large piece of cloth and apply stitching to it to quilt it um, as a whole cloth quilt. So I'm grateful for the introduction of this to my sewing practice. I told myself, oh, I'll just work on it a little bit. I don't want to take too much time away from my sweater deadline. But you know what? <laughs> the heart wants what it wants, friends. So um, yeah, I've gotten sucked back into the hand sewing. And I'm enjoying it, I really am. One of the things that came to my mind as I was thinking about taking this class that I would love to hear your thoughts on is, you know, what to do with your practice pieces. If you're a knitter or a crocheter, um, if, you're, if you do any kind of craft, this idea of a prototype piece, a swatch, a practice piece is, is something you've either come across and maybe you embrace it, maybe you don't. Um, there's room for all. But I thought before taking the class, we, we had this recommendation to cut a square of fabric as a way to practice on something small. Makes total sense. You, you don't necessarily want to come to a class for a new technique and take on the whole queen size bed fabric at once, right? You kind of put your toe in the water and see if you even like the technique. Completely rationally makes sense to me. But I found myself thinking before even starting the class, well, what am I going to use that 12 by 12 piece practice piece for? You're all shouting at the screen right now. A wall hanging, a coaster, a mug rug. <laughs> Just a practice piece, right? There's room for it to have that one purpose, a piece that I practice on, a marker in my journey of hand sewing. I know, I know, I know, I know. But where my brain went was, oh no, the practice piece has to have a purpose as well. <laughs> so I got over that in, in thinking through the fact that there are many ways in which I could use this piece, but also maybe just let the practice be practice. And that there is value in that as well. It took a little bit. I really had to think about the fact that I've invested in the class and the learning has its own value, separate from the materials, right? Like give that its space, but that the piece that comes out of it is a tangible proof of that learning and that has value. And so I, I felt maybe I'll use it as a small placemat. That feels good. That feels like something I would take even outside and lay out on a table or on the ground so that I could put my snacks on it or my lunch. Um, I could hang it up in my craft room as a reminder of where I started with whole cloth quilting. And the colors are gorgeous. These were, these fabrics were uh, gifted to me and I love the, I love looking at them. So to have them hanging in a space has the value of something beautiful to turn my eye to. Um, the last thing I want to share with you is that I've been gobbling up audiobooks lately, gobbling them up. I am so grateful that audiobooks exist. And what I particularly love is the ability to listen to an audiobook while I stitch, because that's accomplishing two things at once. And I want to read more. I want to be exposed to more voices and more stories and more ideas uh, my husband Drew says all the time that he loves, loves the fact that we can be exposed to so many people's ideas and get the chance to internalize them, digest them, process them, disagree with them if we want. Uh, and, and I agree with that. I think books are a beautiful window to that. So I'll put a list of a few books. In fact, what I'll do is I'll link to my Goodreads profile in the, descrip in the description box. I'm using Goodreads right now. I'm considering switching to another uh, reading tracker. And if I do, um, I'll share that with you another time. But I use Goodreads right now to track the books I want to read and the ones I've completed. So I will link to that below. So you, if you're interested in my recent reads, um, take a look there. Hat tip to my friend Jenny, who has been such an amazing companion in a lot of things 
in the last couple of years, but in particular, she's introduced me to um, many authors, a very diverse set of authors who write the kind of stories I want to read. I primarily read fiction, I should say that. A lot of my nonfiction reading would be autobiographies of people who I want to learn more about. Um, I finished Cicely Tyson's autobiography recently called Just As I Am, an incredible book. Um, the story of a black immigrant artist, um, Cicely Tyson was an actor who only recently passed. She, she lived to almost 100 and saw a lot of the American immigrant experience and saw a lot of what art and theater and movies were uh, for people like her and for people like me. And her storytelling, it was just so compelling. I really enjoyed that. I highly recommend that book. Um, yeah, so if I'm not reading fiction, it's typically autobiography. And my book list is long. <laughs> Um, but audiobooks allow me to experience not only the author's words, but also, um, yeah, I've read books by excellent authors. And as an example, I'll read a story that was written by an African author, and then it's read by an African American or an African voice actor. And there's something to listening to language and words from other languages read by someone who, who, innately has the ability to pronounce those words and to lend their particular voice to that author's words. It's hard to describe, but it adds to the experience for me to hear it read that way and to hear it done well. So I'm a fan. How about you all? Traditional flip the pages readers, audiobook diehards, some hybrid in between. What do you love in terms of reading? Share your reading if you want to in the comments. Share something that's really impacted you from the pages of a book recently because I love looking at comments like that. I get a lot of recommendations based on seeing um, what other people are reading. Thanks for taking the time to share this journey with me and I will look forward to seeing you again next time. Bye for now, friends. See you next time.